Well, good morning. I say that a lot, I guess. It is a good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. And yeah, we're celebrating too. It doesn't feel like two. Um, we, my wife and I, we're not big people. And, and, and so our two-year-olds look, look really, really small. But we have friends whose two-year-olds look like six-year-olds. And, and that's kind of how I feel like West Village is, is, is we, we, we look bigger than, than we actually are. That's by God's grace and his sovereignty and providence, and, and, and we just rejoice in that. But I wanted to take a few minutes this morning because sometimes we can kind of, like with my friend's six-year-old, who's really two, is I can, I can expect from him certain things based on how I perceive how old he is rather than actually how old he is. And it becomes very obvious very quickly, no, you're just a really big two-year-old, but you're two, and that's good to remember as, as we look and, and celebrate all that God has done and as we look forward to what is next, uh, to remember that we are two. And like two-year-olds, we are uh, growing. We are getting into trouble, good trouble. We are risking. We are trying. We are learning. And so I wanted to take a few minutes before we jump into uh, 1 Samuel and begin our series uh, entitled Rain to, to take a few minutes and look back, but also look forward, okay? This won't be a long, boring church meeting, okay? We, we will have one of those later on. We're still actually in the stage where you could compare it to being a young adult in the sense that, uh, for those of you who don't know, we're a church plant out of a church, I was on staff for many years at the Metropolitan Bible Church, which uh, is, by, by church standards, an old church. Uh, they're, they're coming, they're pushing 90, all right? And, and uh, a few years ago, as Tim mentioned, we, we, we felt the Lord uh, calling us to, to plant a church and to, to come down to Westboro. And, and it's not as much about the location as to reach people uh, who, are, who are reflected in the village of Westboro. Uh, people who are uh, maybe more well-off and educated, uh, but also uh, very spiritual, very uh, loving of life, but are very far from God as we understand him uh, being revealed in Jesus Christ. And so uh, we, we came down here and Ruth and I, we moved into the neighborhood and, and we planted out of, of, of the Met and, and we're still technically under the Met, okay? Uh, the way things work in church planting and um, in the CRA, the government uh, requirements, we are a ministry of the Met right now until we get our own charitable status. We've applied for that. We've heard back. They wanted some clarification on a few things and we've replied back to that and and so any day now, we should be hearing uh, from the government that we've got our charitable status. And, and at that point, we start to move into full autonomy. I say we're like a young adult because for those of you who are young adults, you know what I'm talking about. You're on your own, kind of. But every time you go to mom and dad's, you kind of use it like a soup kitchen slash food pantry. I don't know about you, but I would bring an extra bag home when I would come home from university. And I would go downstairs and my dad, I, I don't know, he was always preparing for Armageddon. He would, he would have gone to Costco and bought like, it was like a store downstairs. And I would fill up my bag with tuna and pickles and craft dinner and everything else. And, and so I was kind of independent, but really quite still dependent. And, and I didn't realize until I totally moved out that like you had to pay for things like, like water and electricity and stuff. I didn't know that. Um, and that's kind of where we're at where we are, we're growing and we're learning and we're, we're out from the Met, but we're still uh, uh, enjoying um, the, the covering of being underneath uh, them still, and, and we're in our way of growing and, and becoming established. This is normal for church life cycles. Uh, Tom Rayner is a, a gentleman in the States who studies church and, and writes a blog, and he speaks into it. And I just want to throw this slide up to help us understand a little bit about where we're at. Okay, do we have that slide, guys? Okay, now you probably can't read that at all, but you see the circles, right, or the arrows? Okay, it, it, it basically starts here, 
okay? Now, I, I'll highlight them, and you try to remember, or note takers, you could write this down, okay? This is a congregational life cycle of a church, all right? There's death, outward focus, organization and structure, integration, inverse priorities, decline, death. That's happy, eh? Okay? Now, where, where do you think West Village is at? You can shout out. This is okay. It's interactive service this morning. Where do you th- Outward focus? I love that. Any other answers? Okay, it was a good idea in my head, but... Yeah, okay, reality, I'll just, I'll just kind of let you know, okay? So outward focus, yes, but we've moved into this. Now, now the tension is that you never want to lose outward focus, right? But as we grow, the reality is, is that organization and structure becomes very important. And, and it takes a lot of organization and structure to take 300 people, give or take, and 100 children to, to get together on Sunday and, and more than just do a service, but to disciple, to grow, to learn. And we have like 15, 16 uh, C groups, our small groups that meet during the community. We have a church office. Um, we have uh, what's called a task force, which is like a transitionary uh, leadership, uh, eldership, director uh, team that uh, meets and prays and plans. And we have budgets and all that kind of stuff. I can see your eyes starting to glaze over. This is the, the other side of church, okay? And so, so this structure stuff is, is important. It's not bad, it's not evil, it, it's, it's important, okay? And we're moving, as Tim talked about today, about um, our essentials groups and, and getting involved in a C group, and if you're not serving yet, to get involved. And, and so integration now is becoming important. When we started um, our very first preview service two, two and a half years ago, we had about 120 or so people, Okay? Now, the, the group that met every week in between those services to pray was about 40 people. And so everybody knew everybody and integrated was really easy because if a new person showed up, it was very obvious that they were new and, and we smothered them and they just joined us. And it was really easy for them to catch on what we were about and what we were doing and where they would fit and all that. It was, it was easy. But studies show that, that any human being can only know even on a surface level, 60 people. Look around. We're more than 60 people. Our kids' ministry is more than 60 people. And so now integration, it it still is a balance of being organic and natural and and, and, um, friendly and all that kind of stuff. It's not like the Borgie will be assimilated Okay, it's not like that at all, it, but, but it, it does take now some thought and some systems and some processes. And, and, and the whole goal, again, is, is not to build numbers, but to allow the Lord to build his kingdom as we build disciples and as disciples make disciples. And so integration is an important thing too. Now you'll see what ends up happening. And again, Tom is painting this picture. What can end up happening is that we we could leave outward focus. We get really focused on organization and structure and integration. It's all about what's happening inside the church walls. That what can end up happening is we get inverse priorities. Really, that's a fancy way of saying that the means now become the ends. We exist now to build organization and structure and to build integration and assimilation. And what ends up happening is we become total little navel gazers and we start to complain, well, I didn't like the way that Sarah introduced that song or Jeff really needs to come up with a new way to walk on stage other than good morning. I'm gonna write a letter, okay? All of this kind of stuff, we start to go internal focused. We start to complain, we start to fight, and maybe you've been part of church world for many years, you've seen this, you know this, 
okay? And then what ends up happening is I, I personally believe on one level this is social because nobody wants to be a part of a group that's always fighting and complaining and all about themselves. And so you go into decline. But I think it's also spiritual in that the Lord's spirit actually departs. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation or anything like that, but he says these people are all about themselves. I can't use them anymore. They're up to here about them. And instead of the prayer of John the Baptist, right, I must decrease so that he might increase, we get it flipped up and and God's spirit leaves and he stops drawing people to this place because all they're going to do is start to fight and complain. And so then decline happens and eventually death happens. And depending how much money or a building or whatever, you can keep a church on life support for years and years and years, but Jesus isn't even going there anymore. Now, here's the weird thing about how God does stuff. Many of us start here in church. Outward focus, right? That's what we're about. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta go. We gotta make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? True. But we actually start here. Death. Just before that, Jesus says, all authority has, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you know what that means? I don't have authority. You don't have authority. He has authority. Do you know what that means? We have to die to ourselves. Jesus said, if anybody's going to come and follow after me in seeking and saving the lost, I'm filling that in. If we're gonna go and follow after Jesus, we have to pick up our cross daily and die. Outward focus happens because we die to our preferences, we die to self, we die to selfishness, we die to our agenda, our mission, our goals, our priorities, our preferences, our comfort, and we care about those who don't yet know Jesus. And so when we get into this loop of organizational structure and integration, we have to be very, very careful that we don't lose sight of outward focus. But the way that we don't lose sight of outward focus is instead of inversing our priorities, we remind ourselves again of our priorities and we die again to be outward focused. And so we could skip this by God's grace And his providence and his planning, there's no other way to do it than to come and die. Happy birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday, death day. Because again today, I'm inviting you, God is inviting us to come and to die. And so as we build into organization and into structure and into integration, and we are a family and all of that, we're not a closed family. There is always another seat at the table for a new son or daughter of Jesus who's come to know and trust him because we've left room at the table and we are purposely praying and working and going after people who don't yet know Jesus. And that means we die to ourselves. So let's come and die. Here's, here's some stuff that's happened in the last, uh, this last year, okay? Here we go, really, really quick. Could have done a whole sermon on that. All right, so this is a visual picture. We've grown by 43% from January last year to January this year. It's exciting, eh? So, so last year we had around 175 adults and about 50 kids or so. Now we have over 275 adults and over 100 kids on any given Sunday. People who, who call West Village home is upwards of 400 people now. That's not to be bragging, okay? That's just a reality, and as we look out and we see all of, all of the people that God has brought to West Village, again, we have to die to self. Oh, I don't know everybody anymore. And we need to turn the culture into, okay, I can't know everybody, but can we create an environment where everybody who wants to be known can be by somebody? Can I, when I come to church, I, I need to check in with my friends and all that, but am I looking for that new person? Not in a weird kind of creepy way, but 
hey, welcome to West Village, can I help you? Here's a free mug. All right, so, so we've grown, grown by a lot, and by God's grace, that will continue. Again, it's not about numbers, it's about people joining the mission of God and the family of God. Let's do another one here, just really, really quick. We, like I said, we'll have a business meeting when we get free from the Met, and their audit comes back in February about our budget and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is serving at West Village. Here's the deal. The reality is if you want to get to know people, this is the fastest way. I guarantee it. Join a team. Join a team and come. We have a four-week rotation, and your whole family is serving can, can be on the same week. So you all come early, you all leave late, but it's once a month, and, and there's this rhythm that happens. A lot of people serve more than that. You'll notice that we're almost 50-50, which comparatively to church churches that have been around for a while, this is really good. But I don't want really good. I want God's best. And the reality is, is that if you've come to know Jesus, he's given you his spirit and his spirit has given you gifts that are meant to encourage and edify the rest of us. And we need you because he's also given you gifts that aren't just for us as a family, but, but so that we could be the body of Christ. And, and we need you to help reach more people. And so half of us still have an opportunity to get involved. Don't be the appendix at our church. We don't know what that guy does, but he comes and every so often it hurts. All right? Don't be that guy. All right, so next one. Okay, this is some of the compassion mission stuff. And again, it's really hard to see. But, but the big picture is this. Our, our budget and then also the generosity of our people. We've been able to bless things from community events. Like we held a Christmas party uh, for the Van Lang uh, Ottawa housing community this past Christmas. And last summer we, we held for the second time part of the big give in, in Ottawa. We threw a big barbecue. We've, we've done a whole bunch of different things. We, we support First Place uh, Options, which is a pregnancy crisis center that talks uh, to people about what to do with this unexpected uh, gift and adoption and all those kind of things. Restoring Hope is a, 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 a mission downtown that, that provides uh, overnight safety and meals uh, to the children and teens on our streets in Ottawa. We've given over 5,000 to church plants in our city this past year. David Hood was here last year or last week talking about Southeast City Church in the Alta Vista area. We've also uh, invested in uh, a church plant up in Manitoulin Island that is, is there to bring the gospel uh, to our indigenous people and bring healing uh, that is found in Jesus Christ. We've given uh, money towards a church plant that's kind of a, a secret thing, a house churches um, with ESL as part of it as a way to meet the needs of the community for a for a whole apartment building that is full of Syrian refugees. And so there's an Arabic pastor who is, who's ministering there. And so we've been supporting that. We supported a conference for young adults talking about uh, the deeper questions of, our, of Christianity and of life and of the world with Dig and Delph. And then we've done some world stuff too. Okay, it was really cool. The government of Canada was gonna match every dollar. And so we went nuts South Sudan is a, a place in my heart. I have friends who are over there right now. And the, the situation over there, you can Google it later, is, is, is horrendous and horrible. And yet God is moving. And so for famine relief, the refugee uh, crisis there, um, we raised $5,000 among ourselves. And then the church, out of our budget, we gave $5,000 to that. That's 10 grand. And then the government doubled it. So we've 20 grand went to South Sudan this past year for, for refugee famine relief. And then compassion. We had Compassion Sunday uh, back in the summer when we moved to the other school for a while. Remember that? Those of you who are here, and we all moved back. I don't think we lost anybody. Somebody's at Pius this morning wondering where we are. But... And, and we had uh, the former director of Compassion Guatemala come, and 16 kids were sponsored, which is close to nine grand this year. is coming out of the body of Christ to sponsor children in Guatemala, and Ruth and I are actually heading on a plane with a bunch of other pastors from the Ottawa area this May to meet with the pastors in this area of Guatemala, and we're calling it Village to Village, where the body of Christ here is going to partner with the body of Christ there, Ottawa region with this region outside of Guatemala City, and to see the gospel move forward in the lives 
of these children and by extension, their families and their country to the glory of God. So crazy stuff going on. So, boom, next one. Giving at West Village. Like I said, um, the, everything goes through the Met right now, so things will be audited in February as we become independent and we look at everything. Here's, here's big picture for now, okay? And you can talk to Tim or I if you want more stuff. Here's, here's what ended up happening. So we budgeted last year conservatively because we're Ottawa. We budgeted last year based on, on where we were with a little margin of growth. Like I said, we've grown by 43%. So throughout the year, the plan that man made kind of went, and God (laughs) did what God does. And so as our expenses increased, because our growth increased, here's the really cool thing. Without like some kind of like drive or capital campaign or anything, our giving increased. And so all, all pictures look, the last pictures we have are from November, but all pictures look that, that we finished in the black by God's grace. So, so growth increased, but giving increased and as spending increased. And so to give you a rough idea, we started with a budget of just over 300000 last year, and we finished spending around 400000 but we, God provided and this coming year, we, we have a nest egg uh, from, from the Met. Like Tim said, seven years, uh, people at the Met have been praying and giving, and many of you have been a part of that. And so we're praying as a leadership as we move into this organizational integration, but dying to self outward focus of investing that money. As, as Jesus tells the story of the parable of the talents, right? The guy who buried what the master had given him not the one we're supposed to follow. And I don't know if we're a five-talent church or a 10-talent church. I do know that we have been blessed to bless. And that God has entrusted to us resources, not, not just financial, but human, spiritual. And we're gonna leverage those. We're gonna invest those into the kingdom as the king directs. And so we're, we're looking for a bigger budget this coming year. And we're looking to invest what he's already given. And, and we're calling all of us to continue to invest, to die to self and to, again, as we grow and we integrate and we organizational structure, we wanna continue with all of that to die to self and continue to be outward focused as we invest what he's given to us back into what he's doing in our city, in our country, in our world. Do I have another slide? Boom. Okay, those are our glyphs. They, they meet all that stuff. And so we're gonna leverage again, connecting with each other, but also bringing the connection, being ministers of reconciliation between God and our world through Jesus and the message, the good news of Jesus, we are going to challenge, die to self, get out of our comfort zone. You know, we're getting to the point where we we have to start thinking about two services and and do we plant another church, another site? We're only two. Can you imagine a two-year-old being a parent? Oh my goodness. But it's all for the sake of the mission and we will celebrate, we will get our joy out of dying to self and giving back to him because as we decrease, he increases. And it's on the bottom and Dave made a mockery last week of putting Christ on the bottom. He's never coming back, don't worry. <laughs> he's, he's not one of our values. He's the foundation of it all. You know, I want to just like, I'll get a white Sharpie and write Christ in here and all over and spray paint Jesus across it all, okay? I'm a visual person, but sometimes visuals can say too much. In him, through him, by him, for him, that is why we are here. That is why we exist. That's why we will continue to die to self because there's a world that needs to know the love of Christ. Cool? All right. Now, with the time that I have left, we're going to begin our series, all right? If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel, right? So you're, you're looking at the first third of, of the Bible, okay? And, and 
very, very, very quickly, we're going we're gonna to kind of set the stage. Okay? Every good story starts with a line in a galaxy far, far away. Right? Once upon a time. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This story starts with a weird phrase. 1 Samuel 1.1 1, 1 says, There was a certain man. There was a certain man. See, while this is a foreign kind of start for us, this was actually an expression that was used all the way through the book of Judges. Now, just a little bit of history here as we look at 1 Samuel. I say story, and don't misunderstand me. It's not a story like a fairy tale. It's not Star Wars, and it's not Jack and the Beanstalk. It is recorded history, but it's also revealed history. It's recorded history, and then this happened a thousand years before Christ. So 3,000 years ago, this was written down by a guy named Samuel and a few other guys, one named Nathan and then some other chroniclers, and it records the beginning of Israel's history. I say story because it is not just a bunch of facts that you get in a history textbook. The author is also writing to not just tell us a history, but to tell us about God, about his purposes, about his plans. It's recorded history, but it's also revealed history, and it's revealing about him. See, the Bible, from beginning to end, tells a story of humanity rebelling against God and God's pursuit to restore and redeem his beloved creation. And it culminates on Jesus Christ. He's the means by which God does this, shows this, will finish this. So it's a story in that there's a purpose and an agenda but beyond just giving facts. It's meant to reveal things about him. And as it reveals things about him, it reveals things about us. There was a certain man in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew canon, uh, the, the books actually go in order where Samuel actually comes right after the book of Judges. Ruth is kind of put in there because Ruth starts with, this is, was happening during the time of the Judges. Now, those of you who didn't grow up in church, and this is all new to you, the, the, here's, here's in a nutshell what happened, okay? So God sets a, a people apart for himself, Okay, by a guy named Abraham. And he promises Abraham that one day he'll go to a land of Canaan and his descendants will be as, as innumerable as the stars. And, and there's a whole bunch of drama and stuff that happens to that. But he says, look, I can't send you there right now because the people who live there haven't built up enough sin for me to judge them yet. I'm going to, and they will, but right now it would be preemptive. And so you're actually, your descendants are going to spend some time in captivity. This is hundreds of years before Joseph shows up. And if you've seen the prince of Egypt, Israel finds themselves, by God's sovereignty, living as slaves in the land of Egypt. A guy named Moses is risen up by God excuse me, by God, and he leads the people out because now it's time. Now it's time. And those, those Israelites eventually make their way to the land of Canaan, the promised land, and they are told by God to destroy all of the people who live there and all of the idols and everything else so that they can set up this kingdom, which is God with his people here in this land. Now, a guy named Joshua comes after Moses. Moses does some stuff and can't go, and he dies not going in, and jo Joshua leads the people in. They don't get rid of everybody. They kind of acclimatize, and they intermarry, and they start to worship these false gods and all of that, and sin enters. And then what ends up happening is everybody gets kind of tribal. 
Okay, if you've seen like the last kingdom or Vikings or anything like that, you got all of these kind of tribes that are throughout the land. There's no kind of unity over it all. And, and what ends up happening is this time called Judges, which you can read about in the book of Judges. And there, God raises up these judges. They're not perfect, but they're military warriors and leaders. And they, they rally the people and they fight. It's Judges is the goriest book in the Bible, in my opinion. Okay, it's crazy. It blows Vikings out of the water. All right, think Braveheart on steroids. All right, and, and Judges happens, and, and Samuel happens at just the very end of the Judges. And so a lot of the Judges, there was a certain man. There was a certain man. Now here's the thing we need to know about the book of Judges. At the very end of the book of Judges, in chapter 21, it says this. It says, The people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Catch that? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is the context in which there was a certain man of Samuel's story that this is birthed out of. This is an indicator for us as readers, if we've read through Judges, that God is going to raise up a representative for himself, another judge. Now, this morning we're going to try to get through chapters 1 and 2, and I'm like, we're, we're running for time. Here's, here's in a nutshell what ends up happening. Okay, there was a certain man, verse one, of Ramoth, you can fill it in however you want. It's Rama later, okay? Of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Pinnah. Pinnah, na, 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 na. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Okay, he's setting the stage here. Now, what's important about Elkanah, or Elkanah, okay, is that he was a, a, a godly man. He feared Yahweh, and we know this because a little bit later on, it tells a story about how every year he would take his two wives and all of his children, all his family, and they would make an annual pilgrimage to a place called Shiloh which was before the time of Jerusalem and the temple and all of that was the place where people would go to offer sacrifices to Yahweh, to Israel's God. The one who had revealed them, revealed himself to them, the one who had promised Abraham, the one who had rescued them from Egypt and given them the promised land, even though they hadn't fully done what they were supposed to do. So he's a religious man. He's a good man. You notice the ordering of the wives. Hannah is first in the first sentence and second in the second sentence. That's on purpose. Hannah was probably his first wife, but she couldn't have any children. She was barren. And so he got a second wife. And then when he names them in context of what happens and what's going on, she's listed second. Why? Because the second wife had children. This is huge. Now, I know today it's like, what? Baby, no baby, what's the big deal? In this day, a woman got their value, their worth in society based on how fertile they were. It's not right, it's not fair, but this is the world in which the Bible was written. The Bible's not a fairy tale, it's real history. And the people are living in real cultures with real, real uh, consequences and sin and, and agendas and all of that, okay? And so what ends up happening is that they go every year to go and sacrifice at Shiloh. And look at verse four, okay? It says, on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, the translation there of double portion is really debated. It's, it's a weird thing that says, I gave a portion of, of a pair of nostrils. 
yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. Here's what's going on. Meat was a, a commodity of the day. It was a special thing to be able to eat meat and eat it like this. And so when they go and they sacrifice, they get a portion to eat back. And, and, and what ends up happening is that the, the sacrifice would be given based on the amount of, of children that you had as a wife. So you can imagine, verse 7 says this happened year after year after year after year. Elkanah is giving to his second wife this huge portion because she's got a big family. And Hannah is just Hannah by herself. And, and she gets a double portion, better translated, she gets one portion based on a pair of two nostrils. And the text records that F- F- Pinia is Hannah's rival, which, which is translated troublemaker. And, and, and she gives it to Hannah. So you have this visual picture every year of how materially blessed Pidina is and, and, and how Hannah's just all alone. And to make matters worse, she's goaded by this second wife. Look at how blessed I am. You've got nothing. And the text records that Hannah, this year when they go and do it, she doesn't, she doesn't even go and eat with everybody. She goes. She goes off on her own. And she goes and she actually goes to the, the, the shrine, the place where the sacrifice is given at the temple-ish place. There was no temple. And she, she pours her soul, the text says. She weeps bitterly in bitterness of soul is literally what it says. She pours out her heart to God. See, even when there's no king. And what's interesting is that Elkanah says, we're going to go and we're going to sacrifice these things to the Lord of hosts. That's the first time in the whole Bible this title's been used to refer to God, the Lord of hosts. Now, host does not mean maitre d's, okay? It's, it's a way of talking about Lord of armies, And the armies that God commands goes over everything from stars to angels to men. And and the point of that title of Lord of hosts is that God has supreme authority and unmeasurable resources to do what he wants to do. That is the God that they're worshiping. But in this time, there is no king and everybody does as they seem fit. And and from, from Hannah's point of view, Not only is there no king kind of ordering the things of the nations, there's no justice, there's no king for her in her situation. It's not fair. And maybe you're here today and and you're looking at the news and CNN and everything else, you're going, there is no king. Everyone is doing what they think is right. There's no truth. There's only alternative facts or whoever shouts largest or whoever tells history the way they want to tell it. There's no justice in our nations and down into our actual lives. Maybe you're here today. You feel like Hannah, you're crying out to the Lord and you're grievous and you're hurting You're weeping bitterly in your soul because this marriage isn't working or job is not happening or I'm having trouble paying the bills or my kids are fighting or they've left the Lord or I've got this illness, this sickness and it's not being healed. Whatever it might be, it feels like there is no king. And yet Hannah's story tells us that even when there's no king, God is on his throne. In verses five and six, it says that Hannah's Hannah's not being able to have children was because the Lord closed her womb. Did you notice that? There's two kind of ideas that I want to really, really quickly just share with you from Hannah's story. The first one is this, is we need to consider. If God is on his throne, we need to consider our pain and our predicaments in light, in light of, 
Throw it up there. His providence and plans. It's interesting, Hannah's not the first barren woman or wife to not be able to give children to her husband and, and build a family. By this point in Israel's history, we, we have lots of this happening. What's interesting about Hannah is where does she go? Where does she go when, when pain and predicaments, when it seems like there's no king, where does she go? She goes to God. In all of her pain, in all of her hurt, in all of her frustration, the text records that she goes down to Shiloh and she's crying out. Verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts. It's interesting, right? This Lord of hosts, this Lord of armies that controls the nations and the stars and the angels and everything else. Hannah gets on her knees and she cries out to this Lord of hosts, this Lord of armies about her personal situation. She believes that this Lord of armies not only fights in these big cosmic and national and global ways, she fights for her. And it's interesting, she's, she's speaking in her heart. It says in verse 13, only her lips moved, but her voice wasn't heard. And Eli, we'll learn more about Eli next week. He was a former priest there and his sons now run it all, Phineas and Ferb. That's what I call them anyway. But. And they, they, uh, he's sitting there at the doorpost on a chair and he's watching her. He thinks she's drunk. Now, two things should come into mind. One, she's really, really worked up and upset, pouring her heart out to God. But the second thing is, is he doesn't seem surprised by that. I don't know. If someone showed up drunk at church, I'd be like, what's going on? It kind of tells you the state of things at this point. And Hannah goes, I'm not drunk. I'm really upset. He doesn't tell, she doesn't tell him what it's about or anything like that. But notice that he says, go in peace. The God of Israel, grant your petition that you have made to him. And so he blesses her and then he aligns and says, you know, like, I pray with you. That, that whatever you're praying about, that God would, God would give you this. And I love this, in verse 18, it says, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. God hasn't even answered her prayer yet. And yet because she has poured out her heart to the Lord and she feels heard and this priest comes along and blesses her and aligns her prayers with her, she gets up and she goes and the next day she goes and she worships. And then it says, the Lord remembered her. And she gives, he gives her a son named Samuel. Years pass, a few years. Hannah doesn't take Samuel to go and worship. And the reason being is because she knows this will be the last time that she'll see him probably. Because she in making the vow, said two things. One, she said that she would give her son, if the Lord gave her one, would give the son back to God. And she also said, and this was more of a sign to show the consecration, said that a razor will never touch his head. We know another dude like that from the book of Judges named Samson. It's called being a Nazarite. And Nazar basically means consecrated or separated unto And so it says when the child was really young, after he was weaned, probably around four or five years old, kindergarten, Hannah goes and she brings an abundant offering of three times what would normally be brought that year. And she also brings her son and she gives her son into the care of Eli to minister unto the Lord, it ends. And he worshiped the Lord, it says, in 128, he being Samuel. Chapter two begins with Hannah breaking into this huge prayer. 
It's one of the longest prayers in the whole Testament. Longest prayer given by any woman. Next week, we're gonna look into all of that, but I just wanna close with this second thought. See, in our pain and our predicaments, when it feels like there's no king, but God is on his throne, in light of all of that, in light of who he is, that he has providence and he has a plan. The thing is, is I wonder if if Hannah would have been um, in the position that she was in if the Lord hadn't closed her womb for so many years. And that doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem just, but I think we need to remember that, that, that whatever situation that we're in, that God is in control and sovereign over all of it and that the promise of, of Romans 8, 20, that God will work all things for the good of those who love him. He has a plan. He is on his throne. He's not out of control. He is not distant or far away. He understands and he knows. And as as Jesus said in John 9, talking about this man who was born blind, nobody sinned. This was so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. And just maybe, just maybe, we need to kind of think differently about the pain and predicaments that we're in. And instead of seeing them and don't get me wrong, Hannah laments, she cries out bitterly, she, she makes vows, she's hurting, but she goes to the Lord. She doesn't scheme or try to manipulate or run away from God, she runs to him. And maybe, just maybe, he's allowed this into your life, whatever it might be, so that he might display his glory. She leaves happy before he, she even gets a son. And what's interesting, Samuel, the name Samuel is this play on words of, of being heard by God and being given what you asked for. But notice this, it's not just that, that our pain and predicaments in light of, of God's providence and plans, it's also something we need to learn about God being on his throne is that we need to consider our posture and our promises in light of his power and his provision. Hannah had a posture before the Lord that understood that that he was the one who was in control of all this. That the Lord of hosts was her Lord. And she made a vow. The Bible talks about being careful about making vows. But she made a promise to the Lord and she responded with promise. She gave him back. And as a church and as individuals, as we move into 2018 and we chase through all of this, it, it, it begs the question as, as we pray, as we come to the Lord, as we seek and we ask him and he's blessed and he's blessed and he's blessed. Are we giving back to him in worship and in honor what is really his. Four times in two verses, Hannah says, I petitioned, I petitioned, I petitioned. The first two times are petitioned like asked. The last two times are petitioned. It translates in the ESV as lent. But it's petitioned. She petitioned Samuel back to the Lord to be used by him. And her prayer is captured just all about the power that sovereignty of God. The band's gonna come and, and we're gonna sing a song called Altar. We've sang it a few times here. It's just a, a, a good reminder again. See, there's a judge in the, in, in, in the book of Judges, a guy who makes a rash vow. And, and he ends up, um, <laughs> he makes a rash vow about his daughter and he actually ends up killing his daughter. That's how he gives back to the Lord. I guess I better say something out loud. It's an audio tape. People are like, he didn't say anything. Not good, okay? Hannah here makes, makes a vow and she gives her son back to the Lord but she gives him as a living sacrifice. 
And Romans 12 says that we, in light of what God has done for us, all of his mercies have been displayed in Jesus Christ for us on our behalf. He says, what do we do in response to this? What is our reasonable act of worship? It is to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. And so this song, as we sing and we talk about an altar, let's recommit as we enter year three recognizing whatever predicaments we may come into, whatever uh, provisions the Lord may grant, that we are laying down our lives for him because he laid down his life for us. Why don't we stand together? We'll sing this. Again, we sing songs here not because we love to sing, though we do. The words are important. And we line our hearts and and these songs become prayers. And so let's pray this prayer this morning. Let's sing out to the Lord. I love that Hannah breaks into song. We've talked about this before. Anytime anything crazy good happens in the Bible or crazy bad, what do they do? They break into song. And so this morning, let's break into song because of God's glorious goodness and greatness for us.